Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to the Reselling Rebels podcast episode 9. So this is going to be the reality of reselling. But before we get on with today's episode, I just wanted to make you aware of next week's topic, which is going to be mistakes, poor reselling, and then taking pride in your job. So it kind of follows on next week's topic from this week. So obviously, this week we're going to be discussing a few of the activities that the everyday reseller um, will be kind of having to do um, on a weekly basis, a daily basis, a monthly basis. And then next week, what we're going to do is we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail, um, analyzing maybe how a poor reseller would go about doing it, how a good reseller would go about doing it, and ultimately um, why essentially it would be a good idea to take some pride in what you do in terms of your photography, your packaging, your listing, all that sort of stuff. And as I say, we'll be discussing a little bit about mistakes in more detail too. I am going to touch a little bit about problems and mistakes today, but next week I will probably go into a little bit more detail. So that being said, it's probably only going to be a shorter podcast today, possibly half an hour or something like that. Um, I've just not got as many points wrote down, to be honest. Um, We've got one question at the end, which isn't relating to the topic, but I thought I would answer that on this podcast as well. So I've got about two thirds of a page uh, worth of points here. So without further ado, we shall get on with the first point. So I wanted to briefly chat about the reality of the things we have to do as resellers. So obviously, if you're on the outside looking in, if you aren't a reseller currently, um, then obviously there's only a few different things that you can see, really. I mean, from these videos, or you might not even hardly watch any videos, hardly watch any reseller videos, but you'll only see a few different things. You won't necessarily see everything that's about reselling you won't obviously be in the day-to-day so you won't encounter all the different things that, that you have to do as a reseller so you know the reality isn't just packaging sourcing listing you know it's very easy to think that that you know you watch a video and you see these people going out to the car boot all oh, right they're going to the car boot so that's the sourcing and then they're obviously going to do the listing and then we're obviously going to get things sold and then have to package up. It's very easy to think that that's essentially what it is, and it kind of is that, you know, if we're going to look at a very, very basic process, obviously we'd need to include photography and other stuff in that, but if we're going to look at a very, very basic process, it is pretty much that. But there are other things to do with reselling that I don't necessarily want to directly call hidden aspects, because... Yes, to the outsider, they may be slightly hidden because the outsider might not see them quite as clearly as someone who is a reseller in the day-to-day. But they're things that maybe the outsider might not have 100% considered or 100% fought over. So these other things are like accounting, having to buy your equipment, keep up with buying your packaging, tidying your workspace, putting stock away. Maybe you have an alphanumerical system or something like that. Answering messages and offers, doing things like navigating the eBay site, not necessarily just generally, but maybe to do with things like having having the knowledge to be able to set up a sale or set up promoted listings or put your shop on holiday mode or set up something like multi-buy or sending your offers to watchers and different things like that that are on various different locations throughout the site. So there's all these different things and there's probably a load more but there I've just named a few that are essentially these slightly hidden things or these slightly less well-known things to someone on the outside of things so that is the reality view the reality isn't just this packing it listing it selling it it's you know all these different things for example let's just take one of the things there that i've just said tidying the workspace if i have an incredibly messy workspace that's cluttering all my photo area that's cluttering all my processing tables and everything i cannot do the photography before tidying that place and therefore I cannot get any new listings on because of that and therefore my sales may dwindle over time. So it all has this knock-on effect, all these little things that 
maybe might not have considered before you were actually starting reselling. Um, they all have this kind of knock-on effect. Uh, you know, if you don't answer your messages and offers, again, you may get into a problem. For example, you may um, not get as many sales or you may get into a problem such as someone wants something um, and you've not obviously been very attentive answering your messages and then they end up giving you a negative feedback because they previously bought an item off you and they needed to check something with you on it or they ran into a bit of an issue or something. If you don't answer your message, you're going to run into a problem like that, of negative feedback or something. So, you know, all these little these little things that somewhat go unspoken, somewhat go a little bit hidden, um, will will actually affect your business in a fairly big way and can affect your business in a fairly big negative way. So or well, negative or positive really, if you're clean if you're very clean and you're very efficient at what you do and you do all these little things then it's gonna affect it in a very positive way. If you're not doing these things, then it's going to affect you in a very negative way. I mean, things like accounting, this is something that before I was a reseller, yeah, okay, I knew I would kind of have to account for my sales or account do some level of accounting, but I didn't realize it completely until I got into reselling and then I thought, oh, I better, I better set up a way of doing my accounting. So again, it's these little kind of realities or these little kind of things that um, make up reselling and make you realize, oh, I've got to do these things. And, and these things are essentially a part of the, the entirety of the job. So I wanted to also touch upon um, daily and weekly problems. And as I say, I'm going to be covering mistakes and problems and stuff next week. So I won't go into too much detail on this, but I did just want to mention this. So, of course, uh, we have first world problem problems. In fact, my printer has been giving me a little bit of a first world problem recently. Um, so I've had this printer for a few months now. It's a HP one. I previously have bought brother ones and they've been fairly okay, although I have got through a couple of them at this point. I think this is my probably my third or fourth printer. I mean, I was using my mum and dad's for a bit, so if we were to include that one, then yeah, this is definitely my fourth printer in four years. Um, and yeah, you know, the other ones were okay, as I say, probably lasted a year or something, and then things went wrong with them for whatever reason, I don't know, I could never even fix them, that was why I ended up buying another one. But here's a little tip from me, whether you take it or not is, is your decision, but I always buy quite cheap printers, you know, sort of, I, I buy a laser jet, I always buy a, not a laser jet, a laser printer, I don't know whether they're called laser jets, I think that's still an ink jet, isn't it, when, when we're called laser jets. Um, but, you know, they're a laser printer, but normally I spend about £40 on a printer, so it's, it's fairly inexp inexpensive for what a printer is. You know, it's quite low down on the scale. And, you know, they last me a year or two and then I'll get a new one. Now, an argument probably could be made for if I buy like a 200 quid one, it's probably more worth it. It might last me like five years or whatever. But that's the way I've done it. I've always bought a nice, fairly cheap one. It's lasted me a year, probably 18 months, something like that. Uh, considering I print every day, you know, there's pretty much not a day that goes by that I don't print. And when I'm printing, it can be sometimes, you know, 10, 15 labels or something, possibly more than that if I'm doing my accounting and stuff on a day as well. So I do definitely get through some paper. I do definitely get a lot of use out of them. Um, but yeah, so I've had this printer for a while. And, uh, well, not that long, actually, a few months. Um, and uh, yeah, there's nothing actually wrong with it. There's just this third world problem, uh, first world problem, in which it won't take the paper up very well. And I always have to kind of shove the paper in a little bit more and kind of help it through with my hand a little bit. It's, it's very odd, actually. But I can help it through with my hand a little bit and then the labels will come out. Now, I've tried pushing it in more and then leaving it. And sometimes it works. Sometimes, you know, uh, once or twice a week or something, it'll, it'll go through fine. But then other times I have to kind of feed it through a bit. So I don't know what that is, but it's come up in the past month or so. Um, and I've tried kind of messing around with it and looking inside it and stuff, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I, and I yeah, I can't see how I'm going to get fixed, how I'm going to get that fixed, or I'm going to get anything sorted with that. So yeah, I don't know what that is, but it's one of those little first world problems. And it seems to me that the first world problems annoy me more than the major problems. I mean, in some circumstances, at least. 
it is very, very odd how uh, these little things that, that just add up, that, that do, uh, that can kind of annoy me. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it is. You get these little first world problems and stuff. But also, uh, you know, and actually I've, I've listed a few more things here, not just first world problems, but these are... Uh, uh, other problems as well so we've got things like equipment not working so full stop equipment breaking down we've got things like returns we've got things like problem buyers lowball offers that sort of stuff not being able to find an item so if you haven't got uh, a good storage system or whatever or haven't got like an alphanumerical storage system then you might not be able to find an item i currently don't have an alphanumerical system um I probably should have set one up back when I had about 30 items or 100 items or, you know, 50 items or whatever. You know, a fairly low number. Uh, but with 1,500 items now, it's just not... Yeah, I, I'm not... It's not worth my time. I, I, find, I don't find an item every now and then, but it's a handful of times a year, and it's not worth my time doing a full-scale rework of my inventory just because i'm not being able to find an item on a handful of times a year um i'd rather just take it as it is basically um but yeah so so there's a few other problems there as well returns being one you know that's kind of the reality of reselling that we all get returns from from now on i've not actually had one touch wood and i know i shouldn't say this because i'm going to get one now but uh, i've not had one in about four months i think so i'm very very happy with that um and essentially in antiques and collectibles it's one i would say it's one of the lowest niches for returns i don't know whether i'm factually correct on that but you know because i don't really have much experience in selling other things over the last year or so um but it seems it's very very low i mean back when i was selling toys ages ago i was selling video games or whatever there was a little bit of a higher rate of returns than, than we are with these antiques and collectibles so you know we've got things like returns and obviously problem buyers can be a bit annoying and every now and then you may get one of them. And I'm sure if you're watching this podcast, you will probably have had them because I know a lot of people watch this podcast who have been reselling for quite a while. So I'm sure I don't need to preach to you about the annoyance of problem buyers, not necessarily scammers, but just people who are being uh, maybe a little bit cheeky, maybe trying to fish for a partial refund, maybe who, I don't know, are, are just being idiots i mean it's just honestly uh, just being idiots or or they're swearing at you or whatever it may be and obviously if they're swearing then then that's something that um is going to go against them massively anyway in ebay's eyes but are just being you know idiots generally um so yeah problem buyers is, is one of the other you know kind of i wouldn't say daily i wouldn't even say weekly but possibly monthly problems something like that um and yeah so there the, the can be, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the daily, weekly and monthly problems we can come across as resellers and the reality of the situation with it. So that's that one there anyway. Um, I also wrote down, is eBay um, as easy as just listing a few items and getting some profit or is there a little more to it than that? Um, so I wrote that question down, I ask, actually asked this on my Insta and my uh, YouTube community tab post, but I didn't get any responses this week, so I thought what I will do is I will answer this question kind of myself and what my feelings are on it. So uh, I wanted to just do a very, very quick example for this. Um, my granddad actually listed a handbag for my grandma on uh, eBay, and it, I don't know how long ago it was, I'm trying to think of how long ago it was, but it's probably a year or so ago now. Um, and, it, you know, she had bought it from a shop. It was a genuine handbag, all the rest of it. And you know where I'm going with this now. I've said it was a genuine handbag. Um, but anyway, so this lady buys it and she gets it and she says, you know, this isn't a genuine handbag. This is, you know, uh, I feel like I'm getting scammed here or whatever she said. I don't know. I forgot about it because it was a year ago. But obviously me being eBay, me being doing eBay, my granddad, uh, well, both sets of grandparents and anyone really any of my friends or family or anything all come to me for if they have a problem with ebay because you know it's kind of my job so i know a little bit about it um so they come to me anyway and i just say to them about you know responding polite uh, being polite don't try and be aggressive in the messages or anything um obviously state your side of the story or the rest of it and obviously i will have 
explain to them a little bit more in depth about the process that should, they should have gone through back then, but I can't remember exactly what all I told them. But essentially, you know, that's what I was saying first off. And uh, I can't remember whether they actually resolved it or not. I have a feeling that they did, um, but I can't remember because it was so long ago. Um, but basically, the, you know, it, it could have been a scam buyer. It could have been just a problem buyer. And um, it just shows because my granddad at that time probably had five items listed on eBay, three items listed on eBay, not a lot of items listed on eBay. So really, is eBay as easy as just putting a few items on and just getting some profit? In my opinion, no. Yes, it's very unlikely that you're going to put five items on and you're going to get a problem buyer or a scam buyer. If you put 50 items on, yeah, okay, maybe. If you put 500 items on, then yeah, probably definitely at some point. Um, but generally, if you put like five items on, it's not going to be too bad. But it just shows in that situation that... It's just not that easy. It's not as easy as just listing something and getting some profit um, in when we look at it on a, a bigger scale, let's say, because we can see that there are going to be things that come up. There are going to be problems. There are going to be returns. There are going to be cases that come up um, that are going to challenge us and that are going to mean that we end up having to return, end up having to refund someone or end up having to phone eBay and take a bit of time out of our day and stuff like that. So for me, it isn't just as easy as that. In the micro, in just listing one item and selling one item, chances are you're going to be fine and it is going to be that easy. But in the macro, you're not going to be fine. You're going to encounter some problems. If you're doing it, i.e. in the macro, if you're doing it part-time to any decent extent or you're doing it full-time, you will come across... Um, you know, these problems, and, and it, is, it isn't always going to be 100% easy. So I wanted to discuss finally here, and yeah, I am actually on my final point, and we're not even at 20 minutes yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, for whatever reason, I could not think of anything else for this topic. I tried my damnedest to, to look at different things and stuff, and I just could not, I, I thought that this topic would actually be quite a long one, I thought I'd probably be on for about an hour, but yeah, I just cannot think of anything else for this topic, so it may well be that I'm going to get a load of comments saying, oh, you missed this out, oh, you missed the other out, oh, you missed this out, if you feel I've missed anything out, drop your comments down below, and then I can either expand upon them a little bit next week, or what I can do is I can just direct people now, check out the comments down below for maybe a few more tips or whatever. So, you know, if you have got any additions to this topic of the reality of reselling, please do get involved in the comment section and drop them down below. So I wanted just to state that it's important to keep focused and live in the, rea live in the reality that it will take a while. So if you're, what I mean by this is if you're new to reselling, um, the reality is it's going to take a while to build up. It's not like these web pages, and I know that they're not as prominent as they once were, uh, where you obviously you sign up to these email lists on this website, and it's this, this guy on a cruise ship with his, I don't know, margarita or whatever it is, a pina colada, and uh, he's in his shades and he's probably about 26 years old because for some weird reason they're all like 25 or 26 years old and they all have that whipped back hairstyle and they all have a beautiful blonde on their arm. I don't know why. What is this template? I don't know what it is. But they all have that and then they all do, they all do the... Those little red arrows pointing down to their email list, and then they always do that slightly blocky text that, um, or kind of impactful text that says, and it's always in red, it's always in, it's either red or yellow, it's either red text or black text highlighted in yellow, right? It's always something like that, and it's like, I made, I, I made. And it's like, it's never a round number as well, so that then it makes people believe it. It's never like, I made 50,000 in my first week or my first 30 days. It's, I made 51,362 pounds and 72 pence in my first 30 days. As if that gives a psychological ideal that, um, you know, to people that, oh my God, this is reality because he's giving me a specific figure. So he must have pulled that figure from some sort of sales 
graph that he had, which is completely ridiculous. And I do feel quite sorry for the people who, who end up falling for it. But, you know, if you're going to fall for it, then, you know, maybe don't go to those pages. Maybe look into what's, you know, right and wrong and what's real and, and, and false. But, yeah, they always have that. And the, the essentially, you know, we say you can make X amount of money in 30 days. Just subscribe to my email list and I'll do it. And as I say, they're not as prominent now as they once were. They, they used to be about maybe possibly even about six or seven years ago now when they were really, really prominent. These days, or maybe a year or two ago, it's more centered, these kind of pages are more centered around cryptocurrency and investing and stocks and stuff like that. It's less so about Amazon FBA and eBay and private label these days, but definitely a few years ago, maybe not even three, four years ago, it was still like that. Uh, but I feel like there's a little bit of a shift uh, more recently uh, where I've not seen quite as many. But then again, I've not really looked for them specifically. I was looking for them or I was I, I was kind of surveying uh, them, you know, a few years ago because I just enjoyed coming across those pages and, think, and, and just having a laugh at them, really. But um, yeah, so, it, you know, just... The reality is, here's what I'm getting at, when we're avoiding those web pages, those splash pages, those email lists, those, if you want to call them scams or cons or whatever, obviously they'd have to be selling you a course and then not really living up to the standard of the, the quality of the course or whatever for it to be really deemed a scam. In most cases, they're just doing an email list or something like that. Um, but, you know, Away from those kind of things, the reality of the situation from someone who's been doing this for four years, just on eBay, you know, just an ordinary guy building up a small business on eBay. And of course, I've done Amazon as well. And I'm um, obviously going to be doing Amazon this quarter four as well in a, a big way um, or a bigger way than I'm doing now, let's say. Um, but, you know, just from an ordinary guy, it takes a while to build up. That is the reality. You're not going to get £28,712.38 in the first 30 days. It does not work like that. I don't care who you are. You're not going to get it. You're not gonna, if, you, if you ask people, even like the, these big business guys at the moment, the Tony Robbins, the Gary Vee, all, all these people, or Tony Cardone or whatever he's called, or Grant Cardone or whatever he's called, you ask them, are you going to make that amount in the first 30 days? Of course they're going to turn around and say no. Because they've worked their bloody asses off for 20 years to get where they are or whatever. So, you know, it just doesn't work like that. It just doesn't, you know. Unless you, I don't know, unless you are already very, very rich and then you can invest. Or, let's say you're already a millionaire. Then, okay, it might work like that. But I'm, I'm presupposing you're not already a millionaire because... Not you know, not everyone is a millionaire, are they? And you're probably not watching this if you're a millionaire because you're probably off doing something more productive. So, um, yeah, but just basically enjoy what you're doing, grow it slowly and focus on the quality, essentially, and focus on that reality that it is going to take a while to build. But that does not mean you shouldn't do it. It does not mean you, you shouldn't start. Um it just means that it's more worth it, you know, when you end up when you end up starting to get to be where you want to be, when you end up getting to whatever figure per month in sales you want to be at, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, whatever it may be, it just means that it's more worth it because you've actually built up to it and you can say that I enjoyed that time in building up to it and now I'm here and I feel grateful to be where I am essentially um it would be it would be rather okay yeah I'm not gonna say that I wouldn't like the money but it would be rather um boring in one sense after 30 days just to get like you know 30 grand or whatever or to be at that level because it, you'd be like well all oh, right I've done it now well you know what else is there kind of thing oh well I can try for 60k or whatever but then you're just like oh, well yeah but I'm pretty you know I could do that. I feel like I could do that. And I'm just like, well, I've already attained 30k, so I'm quite happy, you know. It, it just feels to me like it would be a bit of a... Uh, too fast. You know, you, you've got your success or what you deem success, because, of course, success is just what you deem it. You, you've got what you deem success uh, too quickly and, and there's no chase. You know, it's like when you... Um, 
you have a girl that you like, you know, if she comes running to you after a first day, like, oh my God, I love you, you're amazing. You know, it's a bit of a turn off because you're thinking, well, like, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you think so, but it's like I, I would have actually kind of liked a little bit of a chase, you know, I would have maybe a little bit of back and forth, maybe a little bit of you saying to me, mm, you know, you're a bit cocky or whatever, you know, a little bit of that give or take, a little bit of will they, won't they, because because that's what it's about, and just the same in business, it's will will it, won't it, will it happen, won't it happen, you know, that's the that's the key, that's the, that's the excitement of life, will it happen, won't it happen, if you're not, if, you, if it, it happens really, really quick, if it happens straight away, it's like, oh, well, well what, well, I'm a bit bored now, you know, could, I could have done with a little bit of an extension on that, you know, so, it's, it's about that, just, just enjoy it, just enjoy the work that you're doing, enjoy every photo that you're doing, enjoy every new listing that you're doing, enjoy the items you're picking up, and if you're not enjoying it, like I mentioned last week on the whole theme of change, change something up, do something differently, and then continue to enjoy it, and if you're doing that, if you're, if you're enjoying it to such an extent, then at some point, the money will end up just falling in your hands because that's how it works. People who enjoy what they do so much, they end up getting the money. For example, with artists and stuff like that. Well, artists is probably not the best example because generally a lot of artists have to wait till they've, they've died before they get any money. But if, they, if someone who is really into film production or art or something, they really just focus on getting that product brilliant and really put all of their heart and soul into it and then obviously go out there and try and make the connections that they need to uh, make to obviously get themselves out there a little bit as an artist or a filmmaker or whatever but with that so much passion put into that project or that prod uh, product everyone they go to make connections with will automatically say yes you've got a brilliant product because they've put all that time and effort into it and, and that means having such a brilliant product or such a brilliant project that they've worked on can shine for them and they can just get loads of money because they've got the skill to be able to do uh, really, really good work in that field. So that's what it's about. It's about getting the thing right, doing the thing well the first time and, and continually to do it, continuing to do it well and then the money will slowly build up at over time, and that's always how it is, it's a slow progression, yeah, okay, there might be instances in your career where you get a little bit of a spike, and it's brilliant, and you're loving it, but then it returns to normal a little bit, and then you, you know, you maybe feel like you're plateauing for a little bit, but then what happens is, if you continue your love for it, if you continue really focusing on the job at hand, you get another little spike, you get another little spike, and then by the time you're 40, by the time you're 50, you think to yourself, bloody hell, you know, okay, I was, I started down here, and now, now I'm up here, you know, now I've, now I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got what I want, you know, I've got where, I, where I wanted to be, you know, and uh, there's also something to be said to always be in the mentality that you have already got where you want to be, even though, let's say, you haven't got that monetary figure even though you haven't got something, you've, you've not attained a certain skill, being able to be comfortable with your level of ability right now and be grounded in that, but then still have one eye on the future, that will really, really help you succeed. That will really help you kind of slowly progress and go up this kind of, I, I'm actually doing a hand gesture at the moment, obviously you can't see this, but I'm doing a hand gesture of like a, a curved upward graph, um, so it'll kind of help you go up this curve upward graph, and, and obviously there's little, as I mentioned, there's little kind of troughs in this graph, or places where you might peak a little bit and then go down a bit, maybe plateau for a bit and then go up, but, but if you're always kind of feeling as if you know, I'm happy with where I am now, then it doesn't really matter where you are on that graph, whether you're at the top of it or whether you're at the bottom of it. If you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm happy that I'm at the bottom because I've got so much to look forward to, then you're where, where you are. Your, your glass is half full or whatever. If you're at the top and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm very happy because I've achieved all of the things that I, I did set out to achieve when I was younger, then your glass is half full. You're at the top. The reverse of that is... 
you're at the bottom, oh my God, I'm at the bottom, why, you know, I've got all this work to do, I'm, I'm never going to do this, it's too hard, it, meh, 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 meh. so then your glass is half empty and you, you might never get to the top, but then you might, so, somehow, you might struggle and crawl on your knees to the top as if it's some real hard chore when it was actually the thing that you really wanted to do so why should it be a chore in the first place but you might crawl on your knees to the top then you'll be at the top and you'll be thinking oh god something's gonna take me off this this pedestal this is not gonna work for me something's gonna knock me down i may have five hundred thousand pound in the bank now but something's gonna come along tomorrow to take that all away and then then your glass is half empty again and then You never know, that pessimistic outlook might actually manifest itself into reality somewhat and you do lose out on some of your money or lose out on some sort of opportunity and then you get taken down a peg. So just be grateful for wherever you are on that rung because there's always something to uh you know to look forward to and yes there is always something to be negative about as well but that's just the balance you know that's it. there's always something to be negative there's always something to be positive about but just take it for what it is and just enjoy the ride whether it be positive or negative at that specific time but just you know just genuinely enjoy it so anyway that's enough of my sermon or my preach um i will just check uh, well actually that's good because we're taking up to 31 minutes now I've bought us some time. Well, I've not bought us some time, but you know what I mean. Uh, Right, reality of reselling. So I'm just going to go on the post. Uh, Retro Cut Curiosity also says, um, I thought today's was excellent. Thanks as always. Appreciated. Thank you very much for that comment, Retro Cut Curiosity. I wasn't going to read it out, but I just saw it then and I thought I may as well read it out. So this is on Instagram, by the way. And then the question that we've got today is by Something Rather Katie. Um, Are you going to have guests on the podcast? So it's not pertaining to the actual topic, as I mentioned earlier on. But I thought I would read it out. I was going to actually just answer it on Instagram, but then I deleted my comment and thought, you know what, I'm going to do it on the podcast because it kind of goes hand in hand with with doing it here. So um, I will probably have guests on at some point. I am flirting. I'm having, I'm going to do my phrase again. We should turn this into a phrase. I'm having flirtations with. I really want that to be my phrase, my catchphrase. You know, people have these catchphrases. I'm going to, I'm... I'm having flirtations with. That's going to be my catchphrase. Um, Yeah, it's quite suitable for me because I've got a bit, obviously most people know, I've got a bit of a feminine side. So it goes, uh, you know, it nicely goes hand in hand with that. I'm having flirtations with the idea. Um, So anyway, uh, yeah, I'm having flirtations with the idea of um, doing a, a kind of an alternate week schedule. So one week I'll do the podcast like this and I'll write down a page of notes or whatever and we'll go through it on a specific topic um, and what we will do then is obviously I will just chat to you like I'm doing now. Uh, I'll get some questions or whatever from people on Instagram or over on my YouTube community tab. Uh, Obviously I do a post on both my Instagram and my community tab on YouTube every Monday you know, a couple of hours after I uh, release the podcast. So, as I say, you're, you're watching this now, you're listening to this now. Um, you know, if you're listening to this on the Monday or possibly the Tuesday, go over to the community tab or go over to my Instagram account. The handle will be on screen now. Um, and get involved, you know, ask me a question for next week's podcast. But essentially, we'll do probably one week like that. And then what would be a good idea on the other week? So, you know, alternating weeks. Uh, I'll get a guess on, and I won't do a topic, but I'll do an interview, and I'll possibly do the same questions for every person, you know, and we'll just, because what that allows us is we can, we can kind of not harshly compare answers or anything like that, but it would be nice, obviously, for, uh, when, when, let's say I've done five, ten of these interviews for people to be able to go back and because it's the same ten questions for everyone, we can kind of think, oh, you know, that's their take on the question or that's their take on the question. And I'm not going to be asking them questions about revenue or profit or anything like that So because that just gets into stupid comparison between people and arguments and stuff and it just would not be very nice and it's not really the questions you ask on a 
you know, on a, on a YouTube podcast or anything. So it would never be any, any questions relating to income level or any personal things like that. Uh, but it might just be things like, you know, how did you get started in reselling? What do you enjoy reselling the most? Um, you know, how do you kind of keep up with, with your motivation with reselling? Just simple questions like that, that maybe certain people might want to hear the, uh, the answers from the, uh, interviewee that I have on. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of doing that. The only reason I've not done it so far is because I didn't really have an outlet to record the audio. The problem with podcasts, it's an infamous thing with podcasts actually that's plastered all over podcast articles and stuff, you know, how to create a podcast articles and all that sort of stuff, um, is the issue of recording external audio. So obviously someone, if I was doing an interview, I would probably do an interview with so, uh, with one of the other YouTube resellers and I would have to get um, them on, but they would be an external location. So how do I effectively record the audio for that? Well, actually, it kind of uh, came to me just by happenstance, really. I was recording uh, Thursday Talks, or not recording it, but actually doing it as a live stream, and I did that thing on Discord, didn't I, with the audio calling. And although the audio calling crashed and burned and we were getting trolled and everything, it's funny how positives come out of that because um, I was speaking to Andrew on there and you could hear Andrew's audio quite clearly on the, uh, you know, on the live stream and on the video afterwards. And uh, it made me realise just today or yesterday actually, oh, if I want to do guests on the podcast, I can get them on Discord, I can record the desktop audio, my, my desktop audio through OBS, which is the external audio that they're kind of... Um, giving me and obviously that I'll record my audio with with my mic um, and therefore I can do it that way and it it should come out pretty clean and so long as the person who is being interviewed has a fairly decent quality mic uh, you know nothing incredible but just you know it's not like a really husky mic or anything then yeah it'll work pretty well and and the audio quality will be pretty good so potentially i could record it through discord it's very very easy to sign up to discord it takes about five minutes and uh, so any you know anyone who'd like to come on the podcast can do so can get in touch with me and uh, obviously just very very quickly set up a discord account and uh, we'll schedule a time that so suits both of both of us and uh, yeah, we will we'll do like a, a mini interview type thing. So um, yeah, so so that's something I have all, also uh, been aware for a while that certain people do it with Skype. Now I haven't got Skype downloaded. Um, I guess that it would be a very much similar setup um, because I would just record the desktop desktop audio through OBS. So uh, I think that it, I still could do it through Skype. So I could possibly download Skype if maybe a person who comes on wouldn't like to use Discord for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, so there's a couple of ways I could actually do it now and that I, that I realize that how to do it and I know how to do it now. So, uh, yeah, that could be a possibility for the near future. I wouldn't say the next couple of weeks, but possibly three weeks' time or something like that. Uh, you know, possibly schedule something with, something with someone. But the thing is, as well, getting schedules to align and stuff. I know that resellers generally... Uh, you know, we don't have uh, a fixed job, like we don't have, we don't go to a nine to five or anything. But sometimes that actually makes it worse because we're all doing so many different things at random times that we can't align up on a schedule anyway. Uh, but we'll see. I'll probably be able to get um, an alignment with someone. And uh, yeah, it would just be interesting to have a few other people um, on the channel. Obviously, I've not had a, a people on the channel in quite a while, really. And I, I, I was anticipating to do a bit more of that this year. So uh, definitely it is on the card. So anyway, thank you for that question. I know I've rambled about that question for about five minutes there. Um, but yeah, so as mentioned, if you would like to come on the podcast, you don't necessarily have to be a YouTube reseller or anything like that. Uh, but I'm just guessing that it will be mainly YouTube resellers that will be coming on. Um, but, you know, if you'd like to come on, get in touch with me. Instagram handle is on screen now. Get in touch with me, comments down below, wherever. Um, and, yeah, we can hopefully work something out and uh, we can kind of... 
do a podcast together. So with that being said, I will leave it there. Don't forget comments and questions for next week's topic, which is mistakes, poor reselling and taking pride in your job uh, down below or on the community tab post or on my Instagram post, which will be up about an hour or two after this podcast goes up. And uh, yeah, I will see you in the next one. So I will see you very soon, guys.